Succession has returned. We can all breathe. Run It Back starts now. Run it up, the run it back. Yeah. Run it up, the run it back. Run it back. Run it up. Yeah, that's right. I started a basketball show about the greatest show ever to be made on television, minus The Sopranos. You're welcome. Good Monday morning, everybody. Uh, Gentlemen, by simply nodding, did we have a great weekend or? I love it. I love that you actually just nodded. Thank you, Shams. (laughs) (laughs) There he is, uh, as you might have told already it's a uh, stadium insider sham sharania chandler p coming to us still from mexico and eddie g on the east coast and we shall talk some hoops um i like this first one it's just got everything you want out of a basketball story heartbreak tragedy <laughs> comedy uh the bulls with a win over the lakers 118 108 they spoil lebron's injury return it, i mean this was fun it, it really did have a lot going on lebron did have 19 points off the bench pat beverly i think the story of the day for sure but Let's concentrate on L.A. Right now, sitting in the ninth spot, this loss at home, Chandler, in a time when they really can't afford any of these, how bad was it? Yeah, it's bad, and it's it's unfortunate that they're also, they're playing teams that are kind of in the similar boat as them that are fighting for their livelihood as well, so it's difficult, and no one's just going to lay down for them, right? Every game from here on out, they have to be perfect. They have to find a way to try and get D'Lo back and be fully healthy. Um, I understand LeBron's coming off, you know, missing a bunch of games. I don't love him coming off the bench at this point of the career uh, of the season. Uh, I understand why and maybe having his minutes spaced out and things like that. But this is a tough loss, and this team has to be pretty much perfect from this point forward. Um, and there's some teams in the West that I'm sure we'll talk about that are helping their case because even when they lose a game like this, teams like Dallas and team other teams are also losing, so it's kind of helping them. But yeah, it's it's to the point of the season now where you know they have to be damn near perfect to to kind of lock in one of those spots because obviously it's so competitive. Everybody's fighting for it. All the tanking is pretty much done, right? You're either you're either in the lottery or you're fighting for that play-in, and they're playing these teams that are on the same side on the, on the conference that need the same things to happen so it was a tough one at home and and their and their best players returned you, you didn't you didn't want to have this outcome if you're the lakers yeah i'm with chandler the the thing that benefits them going on right now is the teams below them are done essentially dallas looks worse by the day mm. portland is l- literally quit they're giving up on their playoff ch- chances the jazz are right there they're kicking and screaming they're fighting and they got a shot but we're talking about two spots for three teams, and the Lakers now have LeBron. I think for them, when they look back at this season and they look back at this playoff run, when they treaded water just fine without LeBron, that's really when they made the playoffs. They weren't great. They took some tough losses. They took some ugly losses, but they got through. They didn't go 0 of 7. They didn't go 0 of 8. They, they, they treaded water, and now they're a playoff team. They just got to hang on now. I mean, I see another L on their record still coming uh, next week against the Suns. But besides that, I think they're in a good spot. And they should they they should push right in. And LeBron looked great. Like, you, I know you lost the game, and there's plenty to talk about in losing the game. But LeBron's back. He looks great. You got to feel confident going forward, even though you took a tough L. I, I thought it was a really remarkable turnoff for LeBron James. I mean, just last week, he just began on-court activities and, and – Around around LeBron James, the hope was within the last week or so, the last three or four games of the regular season, he'd be back. He makes it back uh, with eight eight or nine regular season games. He makes it back with a couple weeks here for them to get back that energy. And he said after the game, he had a torn tendon in his foot. He met with do- with a couple of doctors that said he needed surgery. And I know him coming back this soon was not the expectation. Only four weeks out, I think, for LeBron James is pretty remarkable. I, I do think he didn't look like he was fully there defensively I think that could take some time but uh, for them to get him back with all these games to spare it'll take him some time to get a rhythm back and get back to his place of starting this is the second time he's come off the bench in his entire 20-year NBA career so that'll take time but I think for them to get him back this soon uh, has to be a surprise to everyone and and really kudos to, to his recovery. I mean, imagine if he would have gone to the Michael Jordan of foot doctors. It might have been even better than what we saw yesterday. Uh, Pat Bev, by the way, I mean, the dude just crushing, and I love everything that he does. His antics yesterday were everything. Remember, he said back in the day that his goal was to hurt the Lakers' playoff chances. I mean, I would say that he did exactly that. He also did the too small gesture right there to LeBron freaking James. Amazing, Eddie. What'd you think about what he did all day yesterday? (laughs) I'm going to be a hypocrite because I'm like, (laughs) 
the I hate Dylan Brooks, but I love Pat <laughs> Beverly. And he's like a worse player and he's even more dramatic. But hitting LeBron with the too small, like he backed up all his talk though. He's been talking for weeks. He went on his pod, his podcast is hilarious. Went on his podcast and said, hey, I'm here to get them out of there. They're charm and soft. He talked all that crap. And then he backed up. He didn't have the greatest game, but his team won. And he hit him with the with the too small. And yeah, man, I, I don't remember. I don't remember the random eighth eighth man backup <laughs> point guards of the league telling Michael Jordan he's a little he's a little guy. So that is a little it was a little awkward right there for my goat. Uh, beautiful. Yeah, it's. I mean, if anything, it's it's pure entertainment, right? It's it's comedy, <laughs> and, and listen, he 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 played as well as you know he can, and. This, listen, knowing him, knowing the guys, this is nothing personal. It's not like LeBron or any of these guys in the locker room dislike Patrick Beverly. When you're on, when he's on your team, man, you love him. He's just one of those guys. He's an absolute annoyance. He is a pest to play against, but you want this on your team. And it didn't, <laughs> and, and, and things like this, again, this is, this is hilarious and the timing is perfect. And he is probably a partner and has a deal with Charmin, but just the idea that he's calling them soft and everything he said about going in there and it didn't end well in, in, in there. He's, he's been very vocal about his time in LA and this was a dream scenario for him. He kind of hurt their chances slightly. They went into their place where he used to play, got the win and, and talked a lot, but Eddie hit on the head. I don't know how he does it, but he's got a way of doing this trash talking where it's more funny than obnoxious like Dylan Brooks so I, I kudos to however his delivery or I don't know how he does it but he, he's gotten really good at it and and I'm a huge fan I love the way his brain works like he has the perfect <laughs> troll brain and by the way as a as a fellow Charmin partner can we just talk about how freaking perfect the timing was of all of this yesterday and they play again this week in Chicago I mean come on you can't you cannot time this any better. Charmin got every penny's worth. Michelle, are you a Charmin Beverly. person? Yeah, is you that know, your just toilet like, paper of choice? That's that is a hundred percent my toilet paper of choice. I would have done it for free, Shams. <laughs> that's how much I love Charmin. Uh, <laughs> what are we predicting when they get back to Chicago? I mean, this is this. By the way, schedule gods. Thank you, thank you, Eddie. Do you think Lakers have a shot to win it? Win one in Chicago? Yeah, I think they're the better team. They should win in Chicago, but. If we get another 10-point outburst from Pat Bev, it might be a little different. But the Lakers are going to need to win. I think they're the better team. I think they'll handle business. And like Chandler said, I don't think anybody's taking this personal or serious. They love Pat when he was there. They love Pat now. They're probably all laughing about it afterwards. And he's going to give us great content on his show afterwards, too. It's like, he, he, whatever it is, his delivery, we all just assume he's a teddy bear. I don't know. But everybody just likes his antics including me and like I said I'm the guy who I absolutely despise Dylan Brooks and Dylan Brooks is better and like it's more like serious with him and I still like Pat Bed better I don't know it's it's just more fun this way like a lovable gnat and we love him for that um yeah we're gonna we're gonna talk Mavericks because they were briefly mentioned here at the top of the show for just not I don't know what they're doing but the Hornets with a win over Dallas 110-104 very undermanned Hornets team by the way and it is Dallas's fourth straight Loss. We can get into the points. I mean, Luca did finish with 40, 12, and 7. Kyrie had 18. He also had a dude kicked out of the crowd. Um, but this downward spiral, no matter how this season ends for them, we are going to talk about it a lot. Who is at fault? Is it Kid? Is it Kyrie? Is it Luca? Chandler, I, you know, you have closer ties to this team than any of us. Who do you think gets any of this blame? Honestly, I think it's a collective effort of all of them. I mean, they, they have been in and out of the lineup with Luca being hurt, Kyrie missing games. And, and this whole period of time since the trade, this is a trial period. This is a trial period for the Dallas Mavericks to see if they want to sign Kyrie Irving long term this summer. And will it work? Will he mesh with Luca? Will, will he be normal and, and, and not be a distraction? And it's it's a it's an audition for Kyrie Irving that he can prove that he can fit and if it doesn't work here no one else is going to give him that long-term deal he does want to get paid he's turned down money he, he's he's still young he's still got a lot of good basketball years left 
So this is kind of a trial period now. And they're now seven and 13 with him since the trade. And it's just flat out not working, whether that's, you know, the roster, the getting rid of, they got rid of Dorian Finney Smith, who I think was huge because they're not good defensively. And he was pretty much their only catalyst on the defensive end. They ship him off. They get rid of Spencer. They get rid of a lot for Kyrie Irving. So this is, it's, it's, it's tough because this could go down as one of the worst trades ever if he just walks you know, after this season and if they don't make the plan. And this is a huge, huge meltdown of a team. Remember all season long, we're talking about this plan. We're talking about the Lakers. We're talking about OKC. We're talking about New Orleans. Never did we mention the Dallas Mavericks in the play-in. And now they're on the outside looking in with adding a Kyrie Irving. Irving so it's hard to pinpoint you look at Luca he's still putting up crazy numbers you watch film Kyrie Irving you watch the games he's still playing good and there's times where this team can mesh and they can be well Jay Kidd's had his up and downs coaching these guys but you can't really blame one person in my eyes and the, the crazy part is this team is so talented that that's the only thing giving them hope now you can see Luca's frustrated you can see everyone's frustrated but at this point now it's just get in make the play in and see what happens but this has been a huge letdown since that trade happened and it hasn't gone the way they expected it to it's, Eddie, it's tough Eddie. watching them play because this is not a team that looks like they're enjoying coming to work every day. And not that that's everything. You know, you could you, <laughs> you could you could have a case of the Mondays and still win basketball games, but they just look frustrated. And then when they talk after the game, they sound frustrated from Jason Kidd to Luca to Kyrie all the way down the roster. Even Mark Cuban looks angry like they just look like <laughs> it's not enjoyable at all. And I know a lot of people will blame that on Kyrie. But Kyrie's playing well. He showed up. He's done his job. He's been hurt. He's playing hurt. Plantar, if anybody has ever had plantar fasciitis, it is awful. I don't know how he's running up and down and jumping on a basketball court. It's insane. But, you know, that's his job to play through that. He's doing what he can. Luca's been hurt. They just have so much going on. Luca's hinting at just not enjoying basketball. He, he pulled the Shawn Michaels and said they took his smile away. And, like, he's got stuff. Like, it just seems like they all have just so much going on, and they're just frustrated and over this season. Now, does this fail the trial period? I don't know. That's for Mark Cuban and his front office to decide, but it has not been great. I mean, this is a results-based business, and the results have not been great. But one thing I do disagree with what Chandler said is, like, I don't think this is a talent-rich roster, and I think that's their problem dating back to when Kyrie wasn't on the team. They put this roster together with a bunch of archetypes. They wanted to put shooting around Luka. They've tried the secondary ball handler thing, and that's something that I think you got to look out for. We now have Kyrie, and it's a little bit of odd fit, but there's only been a few games. Spencer Dinwiddie, Jalen Brunson, going all the way back to, like, Josh Richardson. They keep trying to find these point guards to play next to Luka, who can be the ball handler and push Luka to the side sometimes during the game, and it just hasn't worked. Like, I don't know what the answer is there. I always wonder about these players like Luka, like Russell Westbrook. Really, LeBron is the only one that's able to overcome it, that have to play a certain way and have to have a certain roster, a certain type of teammates around them to be successful when you don't have the best versions of those guys, what do you have? You have this pretty bad team that's falling their way out of the play-in and will have a long summer ahead of them after this. Yeah, the other guy that's going to have a long summer ahead of them if they, they miss everything is Shams. I already feel for you because this is going to be such a long story. What do they do? I mean, maybe it won't be. Maybe they've already figured it out and they know what they're going to do. But as far as missing the playoffs, if they do, Shams, what, what will this team do next? Well, I think whether the Mavericks miss the playoffs or make the playoffs or make the play in, I think the goal is to just get to the offseason because getting Kyrie Irving was, I think, one step of the process for the Mavericks and Mark Cuban and getting a, a secondary star in there. You have, now you have Luka Doncic, you have Kyrie Irving. They have three first round picks to play with in the summer. They have some, some salaries that could be used in trades. When you look at guys like Tim Hardaway Jr., Maxi Cleaver, potentially, they have Davis Bertans. They have guys that you can go and trade with salaries and also uh, about three first round picks uh, that they can use. They could have four potentially if they keep their pick from this year. Um, you know, depending on if they fall out of the lottery, fall out of the top 10. But I think when you look at this roster, uh, they have Luka Doncic, Kyrie Irving, Jaden uh, Hardy, Josh Green, Maxi Kleber, maybe Dwight Powell. I, I think that, that's six guys. Outside of that, the rest of the team could very well be turned over. I think those are the five or six guys that you look at and say, we want to keep those guys long term. It's hard for you to build a, a, a really, real camaraderie, I think a, a real expectation on this team when five or six guys are the only guys that you're really looking at long term and when you look at guys like christian wood tim hardaway jr both of their roles have gone up and down minutes have gone up and down so i'm curious 
from a perspective of internally, how has that impacted the group? Has there been complaining that's been going on as far as roles and minutes? Um, so I think right now the goal is to re-sign Kyrie Irving, use your first-round picks, use some of the salaries, and get better and add to this team. And like Eddie said, as I reported late last week, Kyrie Irving's been playing through plantar fasciitis since March 8th. Um, he really doesn't have a luxury to sit through that injury right now. You just play through it. You manage it. You sit a game here and there. But you just play through it. I'm curious, Chandler, have you ever played through plant plantar fasciitis? And what is that like at the NBA level? I haven't. Joakim Noah, my dear friend, he had it, and it kind of altered his whole career. You basically can't put pressure on it. You, you can't. It doesn't heal until you are completely off it, which obviously Kyrie Irving is not doing. So it's a very, very tough. It's nagging. It, it doesn't just get better overnight. You really have to treat it. You have to operate. You have to rehab, and you have to stay off it, which he doesn't have that option right now, right? And the only reason I do think this might fall on Kyrie Irving is none of these issues seem to be broadcasted before this trade, right? Luka Doncic never said he's <laughs> not smiling. He doesn't like basketball. He's so frustrated. That's all new, him at least verbalizing that, which obviously the only thing to point to is Kyrie. From everything I know, I don't think there's a beef. I think he actually enjoys him. But that's that's the only issue is that the, the trade happened. They were on the rise. Now they're not. The only big difference is that trade. So it's hard to not look at that. But... Yeah, the fact that Kyrie is playing through this injury shows that he's he cares and he wants to he wants to compete. He wants this to work out. Um, but it, that that's a tough injury that's not just going to heal. And at this point of the season, he can't, he can't not play. So it's it's tough. Dude, plantar fasciitis as a normal person is not very fun. Because, like, you can't not walk. You have to move around all day long. Uh, Luca, very much in a deja vu moment, got his 16th technical foul, which means he will, uh, he'll miss the next game should nothing happen. I mean, he, look, he's known for this, Eddie. It, can the dude stop complaining so much? I don't, I, at this point, is it even possible that he could? No, it reminds me of DeMarcus <laughs> Cousins, which might sound like a weird comp, but they just can't stop talking to the referees and they're just bothered by every single thing that happens on the court. And it's it's a frustrating watch for somebody who's as enjoyable a basketball player as Luka is. When you watch him and he's whining the entire game, he's mm. hard to watch. He's hard to root for. He's hard to get behind. I don't think he can shut it off. I mean, we, we look at Draymond. He just got the suspension for the... For the tech, Kevin was on his way to getting it as well. Dylan Brooks, like th th these guys are just, they're, they're passionate and I get it and it's fine. But yeah, I don't think he's be able to turn that off. DeMarcus never could. And, and, and look, you know, the thing about Luca too is he does get a lot of contact. He does initiate a lot of contact. That's his game is to do that. And so he's going to constantly be dealing with the refs for his entire career. I don't think he's ever going to shut it off. Ideally, he doesn't get to 16 every year, but he, this is the guy, this is who he is. The Luca block. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't understand this, right? Like, there's replay. Refs are human beings. Are gonna miss calls, right? And you're frustrated. And like I just said, these these players are passionate. But whether you mother f the refs afterwards or not, they're not changing the call. And these refs are, like I said, they're human. They're gonna remember that. And now Luca is getting this rep where he complains every play. He whines, and half the time he's wrong. And there wasn't a foul, <laughs> or he created the contact. So. It is tough, and now to get to this point where it's is he could possibly get suspended, now he's hurting the team, right? Now he's hurting the fans. Now, now he's letting down the, the the organization because he's not available to play. So the, it's it's the, the money sign even here with, with the referee. I don't know if he's just doing that as in like I'm not going to say anything because I'm going to get fined, but he still got fined anyways, which is crazy. Uh, I, I don't understand it, but now when it's becoming to a point like Dylan Brooks where you're getting suspended and you're not able to play for your team, especially in this time, like in crunch time right now where they need every single game going forward, now it's a problem and now it's something that he needs to address. He's young and like Eddie said, it's tough to watch, man. You can't complain every single call. It's, it's exhausting. <laughs> and, and, and there's 2023, there's replay. You're going to see it. You're going to watch it and be like, wow, I look ridiculous arguing this call that clearly wasn't a foul. So he's got it at some point, but he's got to mature at some point and stop. It makes a very uh, likable player unlikable when, when they do that. Too. By the way, it's weird that this gets you the same fine as pushing a cameraman over and, and actually hurting him. I, I think the NBA should probably look into that. But uh, after Friday's loss to the Hornets, Luca did have some words to say sort of along the lines of what you guys have mentioned. Here he is. 
I mean, yeah, it's, it's really frustrating. Uh, you know, I think you can see it with me on the court. Uh, sometimes I, I don't feel it's me, you know, just being out there. You know, I used to have really fun smiling on court, but it's just been so frustrating, maybe for a lot of reasons, not just basketball. That's just, well, that's heartbreaking, Chandler. What do you think about that? Yeah, listen, there's a fine line, right? Like these guys need to play, they need to show up, they need to win games, and that's what fans, people, media are looking at. Wins, losses, points, what do they contribute? There is a whole other aspect, which I do get, where there's this, Luca has a personal life. He goes through breakups just like we do. He goes through family issues uh, and whatever he may be talking about, and that's okay. Look, look what Andrew Wiggins is going through. You don't wish that upon anybody if it were to be true. Like, And so these guys, I think, you know, they're we're put on a pedestal a little bit too much where you, you're supposed to be this superhero. Nothing's supposed to affect you. Clearly, there's something going on with Luca. We can point to many things. We can point to the Kyrie trade, how he's playing, the text, you know, Mark Cuban, any, anything. It could be, we don't know. And that's part of it. And that's part of what you have to be as a professional athlete. On the flip side is you have to be able to deal with these things. You have to be able to perform. You have to be able to go to your job, go to work, and, and produce for, for your team. And it, it's tough to see both sides, right? And and it, it, that's that's normal. You're allowed to have issues. Kyrie said like he was proud of Luca for saying that and all this, but like it, there's a fine line of of kind of you know handling your own personal life, going through all that, but then also being there for your team and being able to perform. perform. And the the everything's under a magnus uh, a, a scope right now, right? Everything's under the, the magnifying glass. Everything is because they're losing games. They made this huge trade. They're now out of the play in and, and and it's it's all just coming to surface right now and it's frustrating and he's he's he he looks beat up. He looks emotional. He looks run down. Something else might be going on with him, but yeah, as an athlete, it is okay to go through that and that's going to happen. You're going to have personal things that are going to linger into your career and it's just how you manage that and then what you do moving forward. So, I feel for him cuz I've never seen Luca like this. I've never seen him that visibly upset and frustrated but i think the more they start winning games the more you know the more he kind of gets back to winning ways that that'll all kind of help yeah, he's legitimately sad it was just a sad boy up there um anyways we had we had another game a spicy game young stars so much going on the grizzlies winning six straight beating the hawks in atlanta john morant 27 3 and 6 desmond bain man bain's fun 25 points five assists look jaw's back uh, and now I ask you, Eddie, does this make Memphis the most dangerous team in the West? Um, For about two more days and okay. until the return of Kevin Durant <laughs> and the healthy <laughs> Phoenix Suns. But and I mean that in all seriousness, like we we still have yet to see what that full team looks like. But we know what the Grizzlies are and they are dangerous. They are one of the more dangerous teams for all of the ups and downs they've had this season. All the injuries they've dealt with, obviously, the John Morant situation. They're still the two seed, and they pretty much have a lock on it now. They just continue to turn out wins. They have a great home court. And one guy I want to mention who has been absolutely huge for them and was a sneaky deal at the deadline, Luke Kennard. He's shooting 53% from three as a member of the Grizzlies, and that's an 18 game. So it's not like he's just did that for a week and kept it pushing from there. Had a great game last night, 4-9 from three. He is going to be huge for them in the playoffs. He's battle-tested in the playoffs. Yes, he's a little bit of a defensive liability, but when you can shoot it like that, it does not matter. We will put you on the floor. We will find out how to make it work. Very dangerous team, and with the ways the seeding might match up, if the Kings advance and they get the Kings in round two, and then, Ooh. you know, they're almost walking straight to the conference finals at that point if you feel like they're that much better than the Kings. Um, but we don't know what will happen with the plan. We don't know who they'll see as the seventh seed. Could be the Lakers, could be the Warriors. But oh uh, they are very, very, very dangerous, and they had their dynamic point guard back. And he looked great yesterday in a matchup against another young dynamic point guard. Great game. Maybe you had a chance to catch that one. It was a great, really competitive game. You could tell teams are starting to ramp up for the playoffs, and the Grizzlies are ready. They're, they're, they're locked and loaded. Yeah, I'm impressed with this team because when the John Morant situation happened, right, it, it could have went one of two ways. They could have absolutely destroyed the morale. They could have laid down. They could have thrown in the towel. You know, our best player is out. We don't know how long he's going to be gone. But instead, they they rallied around him, and they all protected him. The fans embraced him. The organization backed him. And whether that's right or wrong or however the situation was handled, this team, I feel like, grew from that and became even closer than they were 
and, and they are dangerous. They do have a star in John Morant. And when Desmond Bain is, is knocking down shots, coming off screens, he's tough to guard. Jared Jackson, five block shots last night, kind of controlling the paint. And then you have these role players like Dylan Brooks, like Luke Kennard, who's shooting the ball great. This team is very dangerous because they can score, they can shoot the ball, and they defend and they're tough. And like I said, I feel like the, the breaking point for this was rallying around John Morant. They got their guy back, and they're ready for the postseason, and they look really good. I mean, it really was a bizarre situation. It's just such a self-inflicted loss of your star player. Um, not the normal thing a team has to go through uh, every season. But sticking with the Hawks for one second, Trey Young. It was like a sassy Sunday yesterday is what I'm going to call it. Uh, this moment right here. <laughs> or Saturday. Sorry, it's weekend. Um, oh, you know, this got him ejected. Do we have a reaction, Chandler? Is that ejectable? I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't, did the ball like hit the ref in the head or something? It looked like we don't know. Just, <laughs> obviously, he's frustrated. He got the tee, and again, this is kind of going back to the same thing, Luca. He, he shot a three in this game and completely kicked his legs out in a non-natural shooting motion, and got a foul call, and it was the right call. So it's it's it it kind of blows my mind with replay and everything we have of guys still <laughs> arguing this call when it's right there on the jumbotron in front of them. Uh, but this was a little weak by the ref. It didn't look like anything. I didn't see if it hit him, if he wasn't looking or what, but obviously the ref knew what he was doing and he was frustrating and he was throwing right. the ball at him, but angry. But I feel like to toss the best player in a game in a close game for this is pretty whack. I mean, his own announcer in defense of the ref, I think he said he fired it in to him. Uh, pretty rough there but i don't know I, I ejecting him eddie at, seems like a lot but maybe i'm maybe i'm just tougher than the average ref i don't know this is like a weird ejection we've seen a few times too like wh where are we supposed to throw the ball if i put the <laughs> ball down on the ground i'm like I i'm sassy too right like i he threw it to the other ref I have to, my velocity has to be correct. I, it's a really weird one, and we've seen it a few times. I think it happened to Trey before as well. He threw the ball, and it kind of made a bad pass to the guy's legs and got ejected. It's it's weird. If I just sit it right there on the ground, I feel like that's way worse and way more sassy than, than, than <laughs> that. So, like, what is he supposed to do at that point? Just shoot the basketball, hand it to a team? I don't know what, he's, what his options are, but... I don't know. The refs have gotten a little carried away with this stuff this year, and, and, and we got to have some, like, you know, we got to regress back to the mean at some point. Yeah, we'll just, we'll talk this about it. This wasn't as bad as Busevich, though. This wasn't no. as bad as Busevich, though. Like, that guy was speaking, from what I'm told, he was speaking in Serbian to himself, and they <laughs> tossed him for that. Basically, Tony Brothers from the opposite side of the court tossed him for that, and also because of what I'm told, also, you know, bad demeanor, bad body language, and he got tossed. So, yeah, this is an, definitely an interesting time. Right. Well, that's American paranoia. Whenever somebody speaks a language we don't understand, we assume they're saying the absolute worst about us. I think we should probably get over that <laughs> as, a, as a nation. Um, we're going to take a quick break here. When we come back, the Wolves stole one from the Warriors and Shams with the latest scoop on one of our faves, Dame Lillard, when Run It Back returns. Run it up, run it back, yeah. Run it up, run it back, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back. Warriors at home last night playing Minnesota, but a plot twist is upon us. Warriors up to 27 seconds left. They turn the ball over and cat with that. A huge dagger three. Nas Reed with uh, 23 points and six rebounds for his team. Gobert, Eddie, finished with 10 and 18 rebounds. Look, bigger headline, Chandler, if you had to pick. Wolves come back or Warriors collapse. Probably the Warriors collapse just because we have such high expectations of them and they're the better team and we know the potential that they have when they play. But to to me, I, I love the Wolves and I think they're getting their guy back, Towns, who was my preseason MVP sleeper pick. Uh, that's a big shot. They play hard. Everybody loves Anthony Edwards. I love the addition of Mike Conley. And this team is a dangerous team come playoff time where they're playing well, they're getting fully healthy. They defend, they play hard, and now with Towns back, who, who's who's obviously an extremely dynamic player, they're not going to be an easy out for whoever they draw. So uh, the Warriors, they, they got to close this game out. That was a huge turnover there late. Big shot by Towns. Uh, but I, I like what the Timberwolves are doing. It seems like they're starting to play well now and then fully healthy going into the playoffs. 
this was an incredible game. And the rare, the ultra rare two teams don't score 100 points game. And it was fun to watch. It was a great chess match all night. The, the, the uh, Timberwolves went with their two bigs and they had to deal with all the motion of the Warriors offense. And they, they struggled and they figured out ways to hedge out to keep Rudy, Rudy Gobert active and, and how to deal with Draymond Green, who was an absolute monster on defense against Rudy Gobert. It was an incredible game. Now, I will say this. It probably should have ended in a Warriors win because Mike Conley absolutely tried to foul Steph Curry and then was kind of annoyed they didn't call the foul. And then two seconds later, Draymond Green throws the worst pass of the game and then they lose. They also, to, to not get a shot off late was like pretty crazy for the Warriors. But great, great, great win for the Wolves. Great show of the potential they have. Anthony Edwards didn't even play all that great. Cat didn't even play all that great, but he hit the big shot late. It was just a great team effort from them. Huge road win. I always, I always kind of like seeing the Wolves in Golden State. If you remember, they were the team who stopped them from winning 74 wins in the 73 win season. They gave them their ninth loss, and that was their final loss of the year. Uh, and Cat was there. I, I, Andrew Wiggins was there. It was a whole different regime, but they clearly get up for that game and in that city. And it was a fun game last night. It was probably the best game of the weekend. Eddie, I, like, I want to ask you this because of your Gobert um, fascination. Uh, they're seven seed right now, right? They're only a half game behind the Warriors. I, the Western Conference is, is just absolutely drunk. But now that Cat is back and we're winding things down and we're almost there, do you, if you look at the standings, do you think they can make some waves? Are they dangerous enough? I think they are because they they defend and they work hard on defense. They're coached up. And, and like I said, Anthony Edwards had a bad game last night. He has been great for the last three or four months. And so he's dealing, with, obviously, with the ankle injury and is working his way through that. But he's one of those dynamic isolation type players that just matters in the playoffs. They just matter more. He can go get a bucket on whomever <laughs> is defending him. And that changes things for them. That's, that's something they did not have before as they were trying to make runs. And now he's matured as a player. He's better than he was last year. They can be dangerous. That, that, that Grizzlies matchup, if they end up at 2-7, that would be a fascinating Ooh. series to watch. And, and they're... As much as I like the Grizzlies, they're a live underdog out there in Minnesota, so it would be fun to see. Chandler, we want to talk a little bit Golden State. They are in the sixth spot, obviously. We'll put some math together there. Uh, Steph's back. GB2 made his debut um, last night. I don't want to say are we back on the bandwagon because, good Lord, we've been on and off that bandwagon all season long. But what are you thinking? What is your vibe right now from this Warriors team winding things down? You know what? I think they're just fine, and it's it's they they smoked this game, and and this is a game that they should have won. But all year long, we've been saying we're not worried about this team. Wait till they start hitting their peak. They're getting healthy. We're seeing Clay Thompson back. Steph Curry looks great. There's Jordan Poole. You know they're so dangerous. And the minute they get Andrew Wiggins back and to what he was, they're gonna take that next step. And when you look at the Western Conference standings, whether you are the six, seven, or eight seed. You're good, whoever that's going to be. We don't know yet, obviously, because like I said, the Western Conference is drunk. But <laughs> I think if, whoever I am, the six, seven, eight, I think we can beat the Nuggets in a series. I think we can beat the Grizzlies in a series. And I think we can beat the Kings in a series. So it's a very rare year where it doesn't matter if you're a high seed or a low seed. Every single one of those teams is capable of losing a series. And it's not like the East. There's no lock. There's not a Milwaukee that's going to win a 4 0, 4 1, or even a Boston that's going to dominate a series. All these series in the West are going to be so competitive. And so the Warriors, I don't think they care. I think they they think they're better than all those teams, which it's hard to argue that they aren't, especially if they're getting healthy and they get Wiggins back and, and Gary Payton's now back. They're only going to get better. So I think they're fine. This isn't a team you worry about with the history, with, with how talented they are, the way they shoot the ball. Uh, and it's gonna it's gonna be fun. Usually when the playoffs, the seedings come out, you look and like I don't even watch one of the series because it's not like that this year in the West because mm -hmm. anything can happen. I know. I, I, I said it a thousand times. I wish they started today. Shams, you had a busy weekend, a lot going on off the court. We want to start with Damian Lillard seeing, seeing some news there. What's the latest on Portland and what they plan on doing? So I'm told Damian Lillard uh, essentially has been shut down for the remainder of the season. They had nine games left in the year over the weekend as they've decided to, to put him on the shelf. He's been dealing with a calf injury, but I think more so this is a team that's now four and a half games out of the play in berth with eight games to go. They're essentially eliminated. Since February 4th, they've lost seven games when they've been up by 10 points or more. They're six and 16 mm -hmm. since February 4th. And they also have a lottery protected first round pick in this upcoming draft. So there is an incentive for them to get to the lottery, keep their first round pick this year. 
potentially even get into the top five, top three, depending on what type of luck you have, and see, either you draft at that position or you end up trading that pick. But I think when you look at this for Damian Lillard, that you have to wonder if he's going to play another game for the Portland Trailblazers just based on how, how much optimism there was going into this year after they got Jeremy Grant, the start that they had, and now not making it to the playoffs second year in a row for Dame Lillard. He's 32 years, he, he's 32 years old right now, 33 in July. So where is his future going to be? I expect there to be some real conversations this offseason about how this team can improve, and if they can't, where do they go with Damian Lillard and his future? Uh, there are definitely a lot of questions right now. Um, Chandler's played a lot against Dame Lillard. I'm curious what he thinks of, of Dame's future in Portland. Yeah, well, well, this year I get it, right? They're like you said, they're out. They're not making the play in. If he's banged up, if he's got a lingering issue, all the loyalty that he's shown to this organization, shut him down. And, and, and the, there's nothing for him to play for, especially, like I said, if he does have nagging injuries, why risk that going into the offseason? But... The real question comes this summer. Do they look at moving him? Do they talk to him and have an open dialogue of what he wants, which I'm assuming that they will, right? Everything he's done, how vocal he's been about being there and being loyal and not ring chasing, that, that's who he is. I, I believe him when he says that. But he is getting older in age, and he's got to maximize these last couple of years of his career while he's still playing at an elite level. So. It'll be interesting. I, I honestly could see it both ways. I could see them getting a good pick and kind of, you know, building this team one more year around him and giving it one more shot. Or I could see them maybe moving him and, and do put him in a better situation, which he deserves. And, and everyone wants to see Damian Lillard on a great team that's contending. So it's tough. I get the decision right now. Season's over. Why, why, why even play him? But uh, it's tough because I had high expectations for this team with the, you know with with Jeremy Grant with the, the core that they had. I thought they were a, a lock for a playoff team. If you talked to me in October, yeah, Chandler mentioned the point I wanted to mention. This is absolutely disappointing season for the Portland Trailblazers, and yes, they had their injury issues, but so does every other team, and they're not even close to a playoff spot at this point. They're barely close to the play-in, and have essentially punted on the very idea that. It, it's got to be frustrating for Damian Lillard. He, you would, if I was him, I wouldn't want my Portland Trailblazers tenure to end like this. But 10 games under 500, nothing left to play for. And I'll say this. I'm going to be the skeptic. I'm going to be that guy. Dame is third in the league in scoring right now, 32 points a game. Great season. He played the exact amount of games you have to play to qualify for to be in the scoring leaders, 58 games. <laughs> and then called it, called it kaput on the season. So... Uh, you know, just a little interesting, just a little interesting, <laughs> a little tidbit, but very frustrating uh, season for that team and, and looking forward to the offseason. It does, you do have to wonder what happens with Dame because to be honest, he's their best asset if they want to build for the future. And he said time and time again, he's not leaving, he won't leave, he's, he's just, but he's toyed with it as well. So I don't know, it'd be interesting to see if his name comes up this summer. And if it does, there will be a lot of suitors, third in the league in scoring. Uh, it's just I can't even imagine. I mean, I want to because for his sake, I'd love to see him play on a contending team. But I don't know any Trailblazers fans, and I would love to ask them if you're going to be cool if this happens. I have to believe they would be, but I don't know. Uh, Shams, a name we haven't said in quite some time. Ben Simmons. What? What's happening here? So he has a nerve impingement in his back. I'm told he's going to be seeing some doctors this week as far as what the next steps are with this back injury that he's got now newly diagnosed, but I'm told the expectation is that he is done for the year. Essentially, him, the Nets, they're going to take their time. Time has run out on the season. He has not played since mid-February. He's going to see doctors this week. Next week is going to be the last full week of the regular season. So time is beginning to, to run out, I think, on the, on, on the season for Ben Simmons. And now you look into the summer, you hope he figures it out. You hope he figures out the right solution with his back and he gets back 100% healthy. Clearly, he's been dealing with something physical level because when you've seen him on the floor he hasn't been as explosive as he's been at his peak when he went to three all all, all nba all-star games and multiple all nbas defensive player of the year runner-up this is not the same player that you hope that he figures it out uh, you know physically and you know with all the frustrations that clearly have existed around him this season we're so callous as, as viewers and fans of this league right there was a time when he was the next great thing and now we're just like man his career's over uh chandler what do you think happens with Ben Simmons? What's his future? A, a buyout. I think he. I think the biggest thing for him is he's got to get rid of these expectations. And 
with that contract, huge expectations come with that. And I think the minute he gets bought out and he goes to a situation where he's on a minimum deal, where he's coming off the bench, I think he'll find it a little bit. I think the, the Ben Simmons of you back in the day of, you know, all-star level Ben Simmons, I, I do think that is gone. But I think once he gets off this contract, once he kind of settles in, once he gets on a minimum deal with way, way, way lower expectations to be a sixth, seventh, eighth man, I think he still has some value. He still has a great frame when he's healthy. He's athletic. He can handle. He can pass the ball. And I hope for, for his sake that he he does find that and, and, and finds joy in playing the game because he's a thrill to watch when he's on. Uh, and, and and he's a really, really high extreme talent. The things he can do with the basketball at his size are, are really impressive. But the weight of this contract and the whole situation in Philly, it really took a toll on him physically and mentally. And I think the moment he gets in that better situation on a smaller deal, it's like a huge weight off his back. And I think he'll be able to play a lot better basketball, but uh, I'm pulling for him. I like him. I think he's a good dude. And, and I think he's a, he still has some something left in the tank. There was a ton of optimism coming into the season from the Brooklyn front office and everybody involved there that he could be the Ben Simmons of old and there would see that and it obviously wasn't did not happen he only played 42 games came off the bench for about 10 of those as well and that contract is an absolute roadblock for the Nets going forward there's just no way around it he's set to make 37 million dollars next year 40 million the following year no options if they buy him out you're buying out 80 million dollars that's a tough pill to swallow for an owner if you're doing that and you're leaving that void on your contract situation, but if they can find a way to trade it, because it remains a roadblock in trades for all the guys on rookie extensions, all of the young stars they would want to get if they're piling up those picks and trying to trade somebody. Somebody like a Luka Doncic, somebody like a Carl Anthony Towns, Bam Adebayo, like all these guys, they cannot bring them because he's on his rookie extension and they have that weird rule. So they absolutely have to figure out something to do that, whether it's just a cut your losses trade, whether it can be a part of a big trade, or whether he's going to come back and be healthy, because at the end of the day, he does have health issues that hampered him, and he has to figure that out. I agree with Chandler. If he ends up somewhere else, less pressure, smaller contract, less expectations, we could see a much better player. But what the Nets got this year was an absolute sunk, sunk cost, and that's exactly what George Niang was talking about in that interview. You cannot have a $35 million hole on your roster, and the Nets did all season long. Can we get a little sunshine, Shams? Can you give us a little... KD update. I've got good news for you, Michelle. Kevin Durant yes. is targeting a return on Wednesday against the Minnesota Timberwolves. He's going to beat that three-week evaluation that the Ooh. Phoenix Suns Ugh. had announced. So essentially, he, he's been ramping up. He's been doing much more on the court. Stayed back from this quick road trip that they had in Utah. And I think the, the next couple days, today, tomorrow, continue to ramp up, feel better, assuming there's no setbacks, get back out on the floor on Wednesday. And we might see LeBron James against Kevin Durant on April 7th in L.A. We'll see what happens. Such a tease. Hey. Such a tease. What, Chandler? Were you saying something? I like that. I like oh. that. <laughs> Pull up, Chandler. I like that. I like Pull that up, Chandler. <laughs> Staples. Yeah, I might have to go. Oh, you know he's going to. We're taking a quick break here. When we come back, are you buying that tonight's matchup between Jokic and Embiid will determine the MVP race once and for all when we return? Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up, and run it back, run it back, run it up. Important edition of you buying that right now. So the Sixers in Denver tonight. It's Jokic. It's MB. Chandler, are you buying that this game will determine our MVP for the season? I think it definitely has some weight. And we all remember this last time they played where Joel Embiid absolutely dominated him at 47. Uh, and knowing Joel, he's coming out aggressive. He's starting to talk a little bit more. He's starting to vocalize how, you know, he doesn't know what else to do and how it Listen, he wants to win the MVP. He thinks he deserves the MVP. The teams basically have very similar records, and they both have had incredible years, as has Giannis, as had a bunch of other guys. But it's coming down to these two, and I think everybody's going to be watching. Everybody's going to kind of take this game and pick it apart. And I think both of them are going to come hungry and ready to prove that, it, you know, it's their award to win. So I, it's, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be fun. I don't think tonight has everything to do with it, but I definitely think there's some weight and some impact on it. Wow, these are the only four people we can even bet on. It's important, Eddie. Yeah, I think 
It absolutely has an impact on it. I mean, what are you going to remember when you're voting in two weeks? This, this is mm -hmm. it's going to push it over. It's that close of a race too. That this this head on head head to head matchup should matter at this point. And I'm with Chandler. I actually expect Joel Embiid to dominate. And if they can win the game, all the better. I remember the joke was when he was dropping 50 last time. He's winning. He's 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 playing great individual basketball. And Jokic is playing winning team basketball. And then Joel Embiid won the game. So uh, I expect him to dominate, have another big game. And and uh, I'm literally betting on it uh, in our next segment. So I, oh, okay. I'm expecting him to do it and win the MVP. Oh, put your money where your mouth is. Shams, you sat down with Embiid for The Athletic. What stuck out the most? Well, I think for sure he wants to win MVP, but he is so – he's used the word winning like 15, 20 times in the interview. Like he was <laughs> – it seemed like he was obsessed and I think the pressure and, and the expectations that the Sixers team has and we've been talking all year about this whole dynamic of him and James Harden and when him and James when James Harden left the team and got hurt they were four and five he comes back they're 12 and 11 and they've since been 37 and 14 with both of the, those guys they've really skyrocketed and to what Joel Embiid he also said everyone had to fall in line once everyone realized this goes through me here in Philadelphia it all fell through you know it all <laughs> fell into place and we skyrocketed. So that was definitely something I took. And then listen, there were some comments that he made about stat padding, about defense that you can you can read into a little bit going into tonight's matchup. As an MVP voter, I don't know how you look at tonight's game and not, you know, view it as as a potential like if if one guy outplays the other thoroughly and wins, how do you not look at that with with a ton of uh, you know, credence, especially with 2 weeks left in the year, how much this game means, this MVP race being so close. So uh, I, I think it definitely matters. The outcome matters. How they play against each other really matters, for sure. Me thinks we'll be starting the show tomorrow uh, with this topic. All right, there we go. I'll be the bad guy. I like being the a-hole anyway. I like being... I mean, that's the thing about Embiid, right? Like, he's he's pretty unfiltered, Shams. I mean, I, it had to have been a fun interview. He's one of my faves. No, there are like five different times I'm like, yeah, I love <laughs> this quote. Like, I wish I could just write this up right now and just put it out. But no, I mean, he was... Like you said, totally unfiltered. You could tell he wanted to get a lot of stuff off his chest, and he hasn't done that many one-on-ones this year, but I think it was good to kind of get him in that unfiltered position. I've talked to him several times over his career, so definitely hopefully some comfort level there too. Shams with the inside scoop. Thank you. Uh, as always, we will see you tomorrow, and we will be talking about these two guys for sure. But when we come back, new week, new opportunities to make you some money in parlays. I can't even say it with a straight face when we return. <laughs> run it up, yeah. run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it up, run it back, run it up, run it back, run it up. FanDuel Casino's March Weekly Super Sweeps is here, and you can win a share of $300,000 each week from March 14th through April 2nd. Every Tuesday through Saturday, opt in, and any bet of $200 or more gets you an entry to that Sunday's sweepstakes drawing. See FanDuel Casino for more details on how you can enter the March Weekly Super Sweep. So, uh, Wednesday's parlay, um, yeah, I wasn't here, so I, I finally don't have to take any blame. Um, but, Eddie, yours really just drew my attention. Uh, you had... DeRozan with over 22 and a half. He finished with four points and went 0 for 7. That seems like you should get a double loss for that. I agree. I agree. See, Michelle, without your <laughs> guidance here, I just had no clue what to do. And look what happened. Like, the four rough. points. I, I just... Four. It was... I needed you here to help. But this, I'm strong now this week. You can do you this. Here, and I believe... Joel Embiid, over 34 and a half points. That's a big number, but That's a big number. we know he cares about this game like we just talked about. I'm expecting him to score 40 again. So, uh, nice 33-point night from Joel, I'm sure. I like that. I like that. Chandler? Yeah. I love that. I think Joel cares about this more than Jokic does. I think Philly's a better <laughs> team, so they're getting five in Denver. I'm rolling with them. And I also love Eddie's. I think Joel dominates tonight. I like that one. I like that too. Okay, you guys are both on that game. I went with the Wolves-Kings game uh, for my Wolves plus four at Sacramento. I don't know. Just feels like this is going to be a good little matchup too of Western Conference potential uh, opponents. But you win 20 bucks, win 100. This feels good, guys. I don't want to jinx it, but it looks like we're going to get three big Ws today. Does everybody agree? Kings nice by nice return from you. Kings by 20 tonight, Michelle. I know. <laughs> no, no. The Wolves are feeling good about themselves. They have potential. I didn't want to say it, but that was the one that scared me too. Back to back as well, by the way. Shut up. I don't up. know. I don't Just know. shut up. <laughs> okay, last night. <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow. I'm sure we'll get one of those wrong. Have a great night.